Great. So our last student presentation of the day is by Bob Mulgrew. Uh, Bob was raised in Colorado, used to be afraid of water, uh, but today he is a tech diving instructor who wants to use his dive skills and knowledge to enhance efforts to access, research, and understand the aquatic realms. So the title of his presentation is Flattening the Curve, Managing an Unsustainable Fishery. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Samantha. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by telling you the saga of Krusty Oldman. For the last decade, Krusty ran a thriving commercial fishing operation capitalizing on an underutilized fish species. For demand, demand for his product was growing rapidly among markets and restaurants. His target species seemed inexhaustible and he could fetch top dollar for his catch. Krusty upgraded his boat, hired a few employees, and bought a new truck. Unfortunately, in the last couple of years, population densities have been declining. It's become more and more difficult to land sizable catches to the point that it is no longer economically feasible for Krusty to operate. He had to lay off his employees, sell his boat, his dog left him, and he now lives in his truck. Now, some might say this is a typical case of overfishing and unregulated stock. That's the price fishermen pay for not taking a sustainable approach in managing the fishery to maintain future harvest. But what if that is the entire purpose of this fishery, to overfish the target species with the end goal of extirpation? This is the case with invasive lionfish in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean. Krusty's story is actually that of the uh, invasive lionfish. This is terroir volatans, the red lionfish. Its unique patterning, colors, and flamboyant fin rays have made it highly prized in the global aquarium trade. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific region, and their endemic range is shown here. By accident or intention, stemming from the aquarium trade, Lionfish were introduced to the, wa the waters off the coast of Florida in the 1980s, where they were first reported in 1985. Genetic analyses indicate the initial invasion consisted of only a handful of individual specimens. Since its introduction, this invasive species has quickly spread to dominate reef communities throughout the Caribbean. The rapid diaspora of lionfish has been aided by several attributes of their life history. They can reproduce in their first year. They spawn roughly every four days, which is three to five times faster than local species. Females can produce 40 to 100,000 eggs per spawn, up to two million per year, which have a toxic coating that prevents predation. These buoyant egg masses float to the surface where they are readily dispersed by winds and currents. These invasive predators wreak havoc on coral reef ecosystems for several reasons. They are habitat generalists, able to live in mangroves, seagrass beds, and amongst reef structure. As opportunistic predators, they eat anything that fits in their mouth. Naive local prey do not recognize them as predators, and naive local predators do not recognize them as prey. Lionfish have been shown to re reduce small reef fish populations by up to 80%. Their impact poses significant ecological and economic consequences for coastal communities that rely on healthy coral reef ecosystems. The goal of my project was to find out what strategies can best be implemented to pursue lionfish mitigation by capitalizing on this unexpected resource to create viable conservation opportunities for coastal communities that depend on healthy reef ecosystems for sustenance and economic well-being. By using ArcGIS, I integrated the information I gathered into a story map that details the threats lionfish pose, the difficulties in managing this invasive species, and the strategies that may provide economic solutions for continued lionfish mitigation efforts throughout the afflicted region. To conduct my research, I did not drive a Mazda, but I did spend a lot of time zoom zooming with people in various countries throughout the Caribbean that have been involved with the lionfish issue, including NGOs, wholesale fishmongers, fishermen, restaurateurs, divers, and scientists. 
What I found was that initial efforts to build a lionfish fishery using campaigns like Eat 'em to Beat 'em were very successful. Demand for lionfish grew, increasing the selling price and allowing commercial ventures to flourish. I was told in Bonaire, a fisherman can sell lionfish for almost $18 per pound, making it easily the most expensive fish at market. But most places, the price ranges from $4 to $6 per pound. Whole Foods even started carrying lionfish in certain locations, further increasing its popularity and demand. Recent declines in population densities, however, make it harder to find and catch lionfish, reducing the catch per unit effort and resulting in decreased landings. This graph is not exactly precise, however, it is based on population studies from the northern Gulf of Mexico, where an ulcerative skin disease was discovered in lionfish, and surveys between 2016 and 2018 indicated population densities declined by as much as 79%. Fisheries dependent data also indicated commercial landings and catch per unit effort declined by up to, 80, up to 50%. This general trend has been confirmed by every single person that I talked to throughout the Caribbean. It's great news for the reefs, but for commercial fishermen like Krusty, it's less than ideal. Another drawback is that the primary way to hunt lionfish is by diving with a spear and containment vessel, which has earned them the moniker of trash pickers from traditional fishermen. So it's important to be stylish when trash picking. And yes, I am the good looking one in this photo. As this video demonstrates, spearing lionfish can be relatively time and labor intensive. Many fishermen told me, why would you go to the effort of spearing 24 lionfish at $5 a pop when you can catch a 30 pound grouper in one shot that gets you the same $120. Therefore, currently demand far outweighs the supply. Now simple economic theory tells us that reduced supply and constant demand will increase the product price. This is the De Beers model for diamonds and theoretically, it should be great incentive for fishermen like Krusty. However, this is not the case. Almost every wholesaler I talk to has stopped carrying lionfish except by request. So fewer restaurants can carry it, therefore reducing exposure, which reduces demand, thus lowering the price for lionfish. All of this means that a large scale commercial fishery for lionfish is not an economically viable solution for mitigation. You might be asking, if populations are declining, then the battle is won. Why worry? Well, it's similar to the concern over a second wave of coronavirus. There are large populations of lionfish that live up to 300 meters depth, well beyond regular safe diving limits. When they spawn, these buoyant egg masses replenish populations on shallow reefs, and without constant efforts, populations will rebound. So then, how do we keep populations low? Jewelry made from the fins and spines, which are usually discarded, can increase the value of landed lionfish by up to 61%, encouraging continued lionfish culling and providing occupations for women in areas where the fishing industry is typically male-dominated. Jewelry is also an excellent conservation, conversation piece that opens the door to raise awareness about lionfish. Another excellent way to raise awareness is lionfish derbies. These tournaments attract sponsors, divers, families, and restaurateurs. They provide a festive opportunity to engage the public, exhibit lionfish products, win prizes, and have a significant impact on local lionfish populations. In May of 2019, the Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day, in conjunction with the Emerald Coast Open in Destin, Florida, the largest tournament to date, resulted in the removal of 19,167 lionfish, and the winning team, Florida Man, won $10,000 for catching 2,241 lionfish over the two-day event. Now, I never won thousands of dollars, but I was interviewed on Honduran national television during a derby a couple years ago in Utila, and won a crudely painted plaque of wood for catching the biggest lionfish. 
So I got that going for me, which is nice. In the long run, Krusty's example tells us that a large-scale commercial fishery is simply not economically feasible. From all accounts, it seems that small-scale small artisanal and subsistence fisheries will be the most effective and cost-efficient method of lionfish mitigation on a broad spatial scale. Think of it like this. Instead of having one massive commercial farmer, there are going to be thousands of backyard gardeners that can harvest for themselves or take their produce to local farmers markets. Coupled with engaging the multitudes of recreational divers that visit the Caribbean to participate in lionfish culling activities, this would serve to keep constant pressure on populations and protect coral reef ecosystems on which so many coastal communities depend. The story map that I created has been designed to make this information more easily accessible to help NGOs and other organizations raise awareness of the invasive lionfish issue, to encourage public engagement, and to inform people how they can get involved in mitigation efforts. For now, it will be available at lionfishcentral.org, which is an NGO that works to raise awareness, educate, and enhance collaboration amongst those involved in mitigation efforts. You can access it through that link, or by using the QR code. Lionfish are the new normal, so it will be necessary to use strategies that provide economic incentives to control their populations and combat this environmental scourge. I'd like to thank my advisors, Stuart Sandin, Heidi Batchelor, and Scott Ganello, as well as all of the people that took the time to Zoom Zoom with me, my friends, my cohort, and especially my mom, all of whom have been unbelievably supportive. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so we have a question uh, from the web. It says, I heard lionfish are poisonous. Do they require special preparation to make them edible? So that is one thing that uh, is a common misconception. Lionfish are absolutely not poisonous. They do indeed have venomous spines that require some careful handling. And if you get stung, it is quite painful. I got stung a couple of times in December. Um, but if you remove the spines, they're completely safe to eat. And the meat is a nice, light, white, flaky meat that is quite delicious and perfect in pretty much any fish dish. 